you have I to laughed emotes. so hard when they showed me the emotes for the first time. <laughs> I was just like, okay, that is amazing. I love that. We're going to Curse Hollow. The monkeys with the pick. Curse Hollow, exactly. So once again, first pick for uh, for the Zealots. Do you think we'll get another Zeratul from Alex and Koji? We could. We definitely could. I mean, Alex has a pretty big hero pool. Like when it comes to melee heroes, and uh, like he will try everything out. And he's always looking to perfect the way that he plays the hero. Mm. But he, especially on his stream, he experiments a lot. Have so you seen the wonder and joy that is top lane Raynor? Uh, I know. Uh, tank laner, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, a tank Raynor. It's, yeah. it's pretty scary. I've seen it on his stream, man. I am not sure if we're going to see that after the rework. We're going to after see Raynor a lot. But I don't think that before that we're necessarily going to see When he gets a new trait, give him the pepper. Yes, that'll be happening soon here. So going into game number two. Things to consider, Globals, Falstead, actually big for both these teams here. Maka in the past have played Falstead. And then if you're, of course, you have Quack on the right side yep. that always loves that Falstead. So it could be something that we need to consider as we head in the draft. Yep, and also what you said earlier, I want to come back to that quickly. Um, Quacknix as a leader is really important here now. We talked about a lot of the plays and opportunities that they had, but he needs to be the one uh, that, that voice of reason that says, guys, okay, let's let's just focus. Yeah, we got this. It's one of the things where we actually said that him moving away from Fnatic, that might be a big problem for Fnatic in the long run, that they don't have that leader character anymore, that even in uh, the face of defeat can rally everyone to the cause. And uh, that's something that we're going to find out over time. For the time being here, when it comes to uh, the uh, draft, Tracer is being banned out again. Again, she's by far the hero that is banned out the most. Doesn't really surprise the Abathur banned here either. That has been a staple for the monkeys to ban on. I don't want to say mo any map. It's not quite true anymore. There was in part one of phase one, they banned Abathur every single game outside of Tomb. By now, they still ban Abathur the most out of any hero, but especially on maps like Cursed, Towers of Doom. It's an insta ban for them. I mean, you can look at the match from Team Liquid yesterday with Abathur. If you're able to get a lead with that character and you're able to put your opponent on the back foot on their side of the map, Abathur will keep that pressure up continuously, and a lot of teams do not enjoy playing yeah. against that. So Abathur being banned out, that can be used here on uh, Cursed Hollow. That global factor is always threatening, so banning it away, smart play here. In general, we heard from Snitch earlier that Abathur is always one of these top picks, but I feel for the Monkeys, it's more so than for any other team because mm. they hate playing against yeah. Abathur. They, they actually do. So, yeah, it's a very, very early ban for them. On Curse, that makes sense. But this is definitely a map where now the Globals are going to play a role. And we've talked about the Haka, who has now seen a first pick position. Question is then, Falstead. Does he make an appearance? Yeah. If so, for whom normally would look towards Fnatic more so than uh, towards the Monkeys and think about a potential Falstead pick here. But we could see that for Quarknix, who talked about his hero pool earlier a bit. And that's a pretty big part of it. So, uh, Globals are going to be interesting. And also, of course, Bosco Pro. Yeah, boss control. And speaking of that, Hanzo. I mean, we always talk about him. He's whenever you have a double boss play or BOE, you always move into the Hanzo as he's able to have that scatter arrow build and clears it out quickly. If you find one and kill, typically you can just move straight to that rotation, clear it out. If you find your opponent is halfway through their boss, you just run into yours, clear that out too. Hanzo just a very strong character on this battleground. Also, having the poke around tribute, it's not too shabby to have in itself. Yeah. I feel for now this is also a really interesting situation that we have surrounding the two teams. We talked a lot about what Quacknix brings to the team, but at the same time I also want to highlight that for him this is a bit of a spot where he, for, he said that he found new motivation in a new team and in a new environment because in uh, Fnatic and the pressure that was on his shoulders more so than on any other player, not necessarily because of his role as a shot caller and as a drafter, but more so because of the grown expectations of his teammates and the community mm. that that was something that was a bit of an issue for him that burned him out to an extent and where he just didn't put as much time in as his team needed and as they as they um, deserved so he talked very very openly in a couple of tweet longers about that and that he now has that on the side of the zealots at the same time though we have to acknowledge that the the uh, the skill level of players that we have there, while being strong and always in the middle of Europe, is not quite on the same level as with Fnatic. So for him, it's now a situation where more, more so than not, he finds himself in an underdog position, 
compared to uh, when they played with Fnatic, where they are very often the favorite heading into a series. So that changes also the requirements for him, and I feel he needs to adjust to that too. To an extent. I mean, it's got to be refreshing, though. You're building essentially a new foundation, right? Fnatic had this foundation that they were always on. It was concrete, and they knew where to build from there. And then, of course, they followed Quack whenever he would have those shot calls. But now you can actually look at this team and say, here's what we can build. We have a couple of pillars. We yeah. seem to find out how exactly we build the strongest way for us to get victories. That's got to be refreshing for him to be able to have that. Because with, with Fnatic for what, two, three years? Yeah. Which was uh, a pretty long time. The thing is, is, just expect that it takes a bit more time for them because if you play with the same players, not with a full roster, but with at least a core of players with uh, three, with Breeze, with uh, Smexy there, if you play for them for the entire time, then you are all of a sudden in a spot where you you know how everyone reacts and they they know your style, so they know what's expected from them. I feel if you go into a new team and until you build that synergy, that everyone is on that same page, that is going to take a long time. Because different to other shot callers and leaders and teams, Quarknix is very specific about how he wants to to play something and yep. which kind of style he uses. Something that Breeze, for example, talked about when he compared the old style where they played with Quark to what they're doing now with Shrimpy, where they're saying Shrimpy freestyles this a little bit more. He's a bit more experimental when it comes to these things, whereas Quark is looking for this stable, refined approach to the game. And until they really can pull that off, I feel it's going to take a little bit. And you can see it occasionally in fights and how they approach it. I think they have a good roster, though, to build this on. You have four players that I feel like are willing to adapt and mm -hmm. become one. I mean, they've already done it in the past with ADRG, right? Like, yeah. ADRG kind of showed the, his way of playing the game, and the team really came around to it. And we saw the results of that at the Western Clash. You can't forget that the Zealots our team last year in the last phase really surprised us all with that second place uh, play against Dignitas. So this is definitely a team that can adapt as they need to, just a matter of getting everyone on the right page. Now, looks like we're getting ready here for the draft as we're going through the first couple of iterations. We did have a Dahaka come in. We have a bit of a PC crash that happened, but it looks like we should be fine in a couple of seconds here. Yeah, so Dehaka again came in as the first pick. We had the first pick on the side of Zealots as we have again the map choice from the monkeys. Abatha was banned out, so you can see everything unfold in front of you here right away. And this time the early Blaze pick, Blaze and Hanzo. A great rotation here for the monkeys. I actually like this a lot. Now they are already in the lead. They won game number one, they took it on Infernal Shrines. But this is a fantastic rotation in the 1-2 setup for them. Hanzo for the control, we spoke about it a bit when we were talking about bosses. And on top of that, they now have also Blaze, so that's the sustain, that wave clear on the solo lane. And even on a boss fight, a quick bunker can really help you to yeah. just like uh, get that fight going and sustain it through a long time. I am interested to see if Zealots get Genji here, which I think would be good for them, to allow for them to uh, try and slow down Hanzo in those fights. And then, of course, Malfurion wouldn't be a bad pickup here, too, to get that poke around the tributes and try to have a little bit more control. Because so far, Monkeys, with their 1-2, this is a great draft for this battleground. Zealots being able to answer that back and saying, listen, we can dive you, we can actually get on top of you if we need to, and we have Dahaka to come in for the rotation, yeah. would be a strong statement for them. The question for me is also if you, at this point, for example, would consider to go into Stukov. Now, granted, for Zealots, they don't have Blaze. Normally, you try to pair him, but you could still get someone else in there. It shows in favor of Malfurion. Because the one thing is, around tribute fights and also bosses, if you actually take the position early, then you can get great corners that you should completely shut down with Stukov just placing a lurking yeah. arm where it's incredibly difficult for your opponent to engage or get value of out of crucial talents and uh, heroics like Bunker, for example. But Malfurion, taken here for them, you can still with Root zone them out, very, very likely. And now we have also Genji, you talked about the rotation, about him being set up here. I mean, both teams with a good start here, but I, I really like that first rotation for the Monkeys. I think that gives them strong base and now they can uh, flexible uh, like with a lot of flexibility just like uh, go into the next pick fans for bands here oh they go for the garage to be fair robodoba is on the opposing side yeah and robodoba when he is on garage he looks like a different player he is able to be the playmaker for his team i think he's ridiculous in garage right? yeah I, he's straight i mean he is stupid good on that hero when he played it in the, the last series, it was just map. insane. It's not only exactly on this map too. It's not only it's not only kill opportunities. He denied so many kills by just always being in the right spot at the right time, saving a target, turning around, eating a stun uh, mm. with the indomitable, and uh, making sure that he would just completely shut down players on the other side. So I think this is a fantastic ban. Looking over the zealots for them. 
you want to take a support out? Is there anything that you're scared of so far as a Genji player? I'm actually in a situation where I'm not quite sure what I want to see here yeah. as a ban, but you can target Maka. This is one of the things. So Maka, I would say, would probably pick up Li Ming if he can. That might be one of the heroes that you could ban out, but they're going for Rema Baller instead, banning out the front line and saying, okay, Anubarak in the last game was a bit of a problem, especially with Cocoon being used as aggressively. Mm. So we're going to get rid of Cocoon instead. Could still see Li Ming for them. Yeah, with an Anubarak ban, it suddenly becomes something that's like, wait, do I want Li Ming here? And I think for Rema Baller, we're either looking at Meriden or Johanna now. But yeah, Li Ming would still be a good pick. Marco has played that a lot. I would expect Crosby to be on Hanzo. What about Diablo? For Rimmer. I'm not sure if I... I know you typically don't pick him up on this battleground, but I like him against Genji. Pretty decent control against a Haka too if he comes on the flank. You can shadow charge him. Kind of hold down the flank coming your way, and then you have Jeff Propulsion to follow it up immediately when you go in for that flop, and then you have the bunker to drop it down too. Muradin, though. And Rhaegar. And Rhaegar. I like Muradin here quite a bit. Again, Muradin or Johanna were the two where I was like that what I was considering for him here. Muradin a bit more so. You have the extra escape and also the engage. I think that's kind of important for him too. Rhaegar comes in as the support. It's actually interesting. I could have definitely seen them switch away from Rhaegar a bit. I mean, you have Splendor there. So uh, he definitely has a variety of heroes that he could play in that situation. But Rhaegar for him is going to hinge heavily on him getting the Ancestrals through. I'm just worried about how they're going to control Genji here. I guess you have the bunker, so you're fine if you need to get into a safety moment. Leaming Interior comes out for Zealots. I could have so... I really thought the monkeys would pick Leaming for, uh, for Maka. So what does he get here instead? Full stat? I'm actually not certain. He's played false a I lot. I mean, they obviously had had a thought process here. This is one of those situations where you could have picked your support on the last point. If you really felt that you needed to get a certain damage hero in because your opponent is threatening to take it away, you would have just simply dropped the support into the fifth pick position. That didn't happen. But I could have seen them completely go into a Muradin Liming um, rotation and then on the last pick go for any support. But they wanted to be flexible to adapt to what's being chosen here. But I think now Liming is taken away from Marker. And the question is still, okay, what are they going to replace that with? Tyrael for Zealots gives them additional shields after well, Furane has the heals already in the setup, but it also gives them the sanctification around boss fights that we often have seen. It's going to be Venus. Leaming, Tyrael, and then Phoenix to wind it out there. It's actually, re it's actually pretty cool too because now we're having. I still think that we're going to see Crosby on uh, um, on Hanzo, yeah. and that puts now Phoenix into the hands of Marka, whereas in the previous game it was exactly the other way around. You had Phoenix played by, by Crosby, so Phoenix still works with this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he actually ran Phoenix the other day against yeah. Team Liquid, so okay. New hero coming in here for Marke, second playthrough, it looks like for the weekend. If you look at the drafts, I actually... I still am curious if he wanted Li Ming. If that was a pick away, or I mean, it's a reset pick comp, right? Like, yeah. For Zealots. Here. No, for for Zealots, obviously. Oh, for I, it. Yeah, yeah, for Maka. I, I really like. I looked at the draft before the last picks, and I was just like, okay, Maka is going to try and go for his living. And I might be wrong on that, but that's I definitely going to ask him later because I want to know. Okay, was that actually thought process here? Phoenix is by no means bad. I mean, we had top damage for Crosby in the last game on Phoenix, but uh, still from Marke, you know, like he's always that, he has that aggression and yeah. he has to go in, so with Calamity and everything, getting the resets, I thought that was more so his style and more down his alley. Who do you vote for? I think I'm actually looking at Zealots and I kind of like what they have here. I mean, Mostly because it's I like the last draft a lot. I feel the front line this time for the monkeys is, is better. I'm a little bit torn on uh, the Rhaegar aspect of the composition. For Zealots, I feel they have a composition that is fantastic when they can pull it off on the execution side. But I think a little bit easier on that is a little bit more stable as what the monkeys have. Sure. I think it's a 50-50, to be honest. Well, let's go to game number two. The monkeys currently up 1-0 to zero over the Zealots. On the left side, Maka to play Phoenix, Rimmer on Muradin, Splinter on Rhaegar, Crosby on Hanzo, and Alex the Pro G playing Blaze. And over to the right side of the map on Curse Tolo, we have the Zealots with Shad. On Malfurion, we have Quatnix this time on Genji, Chris playing Li Ming here. Robotoba on Tyria, and Zarmini on the offlane with the Haka once again.
Execution is going to be important for the Zealots, but if they can execute, they can do well here. Reset composition between Genji and Li Ming. With Ethereal to bolster off that dive is always a great composition to have. However, if monkeys are able to stop that in its tracks, they'll be able to answer back well, and they'll also have a salvo to answer back with their kills. So the monkeys at this point in the mid lane, Blaze is already hiding at the top. Just not showing in vision, trying to make it a little bit more difficult for the Zealots to judge what's happening here. Ooh, that was a pretty quick engage on the Crosby. And he immediately backs off and says, like, okay, that ain't happening. Muradin is taking over the experience in the lane. He's got an update too. Last year we hit 28 million cheers. Until BlizzCon? I, I actually think we can beat it this year. I think we can too. Splendor doing really well with Marker at the bot lane. Wow, with that heavy mid lane pressure that we're seeing there. This is actually a great job by them getting that early tower. Opening it up, it's in the boss lane too, which could become a factor later on. Tribute will be spawning in the south here too, so Giant should be grabbed pretty quickly here for Monkeys. Have that pushing in the top lane. And with Rhaegar backing, they could actually send him over there to do that. Rhaegar, fantastic for working on Merc Camps. <laughs> I'm actually really liking the way that the monkeys are using those aggressive moves on the lane. They didn't go into any kind of battle in the mid lane first. They just like split the place to the top right away. Had that set up towards the bot lane. Grabbing the early tower is definitely giving them a bit of an edge in experience. And both of the teams now working on their knights too. This should actually be an earlier grab for the zealots and that means that the timing could be absolutely crucial for the monkeys. If they can delay their own after the zealots take theirs, they could defend here quite nicely. But actually, I'm wrong. Splendor turns out to be a bit quicker here with the uh, with the grabs of both of them with the identical timing. Hanzo will be able to clear that when he hits a little four. Should be going to the scatter build. Hang on, Robo Double gets aggressive. He goes straight for Crosby, but Alex Apoji was waiting in the corner. He comes in with a jet propulsion. The flood comes out, but nobody triggers it. Crosby taking some decent damage. Crosby has to hop away while Rimmer comes in. They're looking for Shad. Shad, the Malfurion locked in the corner, and they'll get taken out. Well, Furion is down, and that was a very quick commitment from both teams. There's a bit of a bait going on there with everyone just waiting in the brush for the engagement. They nearly took Hanzo down, but they're not able to get that. Problem, of course, was that the Zealots did only have four players here. Even after the Hakka burrowed in, because Li Ming was still stuck at the bot lane. So now that's a kill confirmed. Still a bit more of a lead here for the Menagerie. And we have them clearing the camp and now starting to pressure the mid lane wall as the tribute spawns towards the bottom. I feel like that was a, a massive play for them. They in the five in the middle, they soak the bottom in the top wave too, so they jump up in experience. And the spell armor hasn't been cleared out yet as that knight continues, or that wizard continues to give them the ability to fight in this area. They're going straight for the turret too. Should be able to grab that. Can they get the top one too with a minion wave coming in? I don't know, monkeys seem to be running over the zealots here in the middle wave. They're doing extremely well with this. They're actually about to let the bottom tribute go. I mean, if they can interrupt it, that would be great, but I think they're willing to let it go. And I feel the reason for this is actually quite simple. It spawns bot lane. They have the Haka at the top already in position, so it's going to be a bit of an awkward fight for you no matter what, because the Haka can burrow in. As long as you get value in the middle and by destroying the wall, that's what they achieve, they're going to be finding themselves in a slight lead. So they're giving up the first tribute for the bit of an advantage, and they're just banking their hopes on grabbing earlier level 7 and maybe level 10 talents, and through those they hope to get the tributes. Still got the middle wave opened up. Executing strategy, run it down mid, and they quite limited it with all five. <laughs> grabbed a couple turrets, grabbed a gate as well. The problem with that strategy is you do give up objectives occasionally, and they did lose that tribute to the bottom. It's only one though, seven connects, and they have everyone up here at the top lane. It's totally fair to give that one up. Yeah. There's no issue with that whatsoever. Now, the Haka has the ability to move back down. It's actually from the Zealot's perspective, I really like the way that they are playing the macro aspect now. So, I liked how Monkeys gave up the tribute to get value in the mid lane. It was strong, and we see it reflected in the slight experience lead by half a level that they have. But I also like what the Zealots are now doing again. They have the camp at the bot lane pushing. Splendor is actually getting that channel through because of that earlier level 7, even though Blaze was at the bot lane. The Haka has now moved in to push him a bit. But it's all working out for the monkeys. Zealots do their homework, they get the night camp, uh, sorry, they get the Siege Shine camp in, but the monkeys had the earlier position and therefore the Zealots weren't quite willing to uh, engage into that. Giants finally get cleaned up. The experience lead starting to trickle in here for monkeys as they hit level 8. 7 and 3 quarters here for Zealots, about a half a level lead above them. Tribute spawns in an aggressive spot here for the Zealots in this top right corner. They can defend it pretty well. Monkey's rotating down in the middle wave to make sure they soak up, but they actually catch a Tyrael. Stormbolt comes out, Robodoba jumps around, but he sees Crosby as Crosby comes forward and gets that auto attack. Yeah, Crossbow with good damage here now too. 
Five minutes in, so the boss is on the map now. That was a highlight quickly that we have Swift Retribution taken on Tyrion. So going for the audio attacks a little bit more. Didn't really expect it, to be honest, to come in as a talent here, but it definitely is going to help out Genji in particular. I mean, the movement speed is great, too. Yeah. To get 20% more movement speed. Helps the Haka as well if he tries to get in one of the drags. True. Gives you the ability to die Hanzo and straight try to run him over with Tyrion. And they'll need that, too, when they get the Sanification level 10. Tribute in the top right corner, and Zealots are doing their best here to set a concave up on top of Make. It's still the advantage in experience that's going to be crucial here, because this is one of those where you can attempt to stall it out until you hit level 10s, and the Zealots need to either grab the Tribute real quickly, or they're going to have a problem. And look at that move at the bot lane. While we are having two heroes posture here, we actually see the boss being attacked by Rhaegar and Hansel. That's a neat little move there. Scatteros. Pretty darn good, and they cleared that thing up quick to Haka. Haka. Scout it out. If he scouts it out, Zealots could come over here and actually contest it. Nice. Yeah, Aussie. they screwed that up a little bit, but that was a pretty cool idea. It doesn't work out, though. And now they are nearly on level 10. If they can get a kill against Squatnik, Squat went actually deep with this. He went deep. He has his fight teammates behind him. They're trying to find a fight before 10 connects, but with Jeff Potion on the side. Monkeys try to hold Zealots here, but Zealots are able to fight their way out and should get away safely. I really like the idea of the monkeys. It was really, really well done, but they needed to be a little bit more... Yeah, a little bit more secretive with it. Just trying to maybe stall out the tribute just slightly, show a bit more there. But it was a pretty cool rotation that just quite didn't work out, but they're grabbing the boss now, and this time you can't contest it because there's no level 10. So it's going to be a boss plus the tribute that they should be able to grab on the back of that. Yeah, good heads up play there, Haka. Scouting it out earlier. But it's all said and done, a boss still goes over to the monkeys. And again, I want to come back to this. This is actually all possible because they earlier let the first tribute go. So this is really, this is the reward that they get. That half level lead that allows them to now grab a boss and get that second tribute. So this is exactly what they've been playing for, the slight advantage. But actually they delayed it a bit too long. Now it's level 10 here. But this is an awkward position for the Zealots. They still have to get this one. Haka can burrow in. 10 does connect. Zealots are able to soak it up. Drag comes out. He exiles the Proji. Oh. He steps up. Sanification gets used. But Zealots are not going to be able to find a target. Arrow comes out, but it whiffs from Cross be unable to connect. Yeah, that's a bit of a problem. There was already some as a setup. But look at the mid in the bot lane. Yeah. Zealots can't really fight here for too long. If they waste time here, they're going to lose too much in the middle and at the bottom. Especially they need to start. They need to set up the defense. And especially with turrets being gone in the middle lane. That means it's going straight to the fort. And there exactly. we go. Night Camp finally gets on top of that fort. And Zealots will have to retreat. The tribute gets grabbed, but Zarmni gets slowed. Rimmer's trying to chase him down. Robodoba comes from the side here. We'll be able to give them a shield. The sanification was using the fight, so they have to be careful and try to retreat. And they do. Yeah, the monkeys with really good value. Again, the early wow. letting the early tribute go allowed them to grab that boss just at the time as we see the tribute spawn. And now they are more than a level ahead by taking down these two structures. And they can still rotate to the top. Now, you won't have an opportunity to take the top boss. That shouldn't really be possible because the Zealots are, of course, going to double check that pretty quickly. Rema Bola is just anchoring the play here in the bush to make sure that the Zealots themselves are not thinking about that. They are creating a bit of space for Blaze in particular, but there's still a Siege Giant camp that they can now take on their own side. So, so far, the plan is actually going pretty well for Monkeys. I think the Giants pushing the top lane too. There's a couple of iffy moments, you know, when they were trying to sneak that boss and it was scouted out by Dehaka. There was a heads up play by the Zealots, realizing that only two heroes showed around the tribute. So they knew that something was up. Two, three seconds later, and the monkeys would have confirmed the boss. But as is, it was still a decent play by them. It's Curse Point. Monkeys get top lane pushing in with the Giants here. Yeah. So they'll be looking to slow this down as much as possible, especially with them trying to soak level 13. And they get the earlier position now as well. Yeah, they're set up here already. Even trying to maybe even look at the Haka. Rimmer anchoring the bush, so it should be just fine. As Zealots rotate down, they want to fight this, as they would love to get this first point. Yeah, and they can also delay this a little bit. The Haka is about to get in. Alex, the drag misses. That was big. The jet propulsion does not. And here comes the turnaround attempt. Chris is firing in from behind. Doesn't connect yet, but he is Ramabola sneaking in from the side, trying to get that flank going. Hits another storm ball at the top. Another fort is about to fall. Big arrow, arrow hits, and here comes the salvo. Salvo connects on Shad. Some damage comes out. Sanification is used, but Genji has been deleted. All three targets left for Zelda trying to retreat, but there's a kill. Rimmer continues to chase forward. Harmony has to burrow just to stay alive, but as soon as he pops up, Monkeys will be able to try to clear him up. Scatter arrow hits Robodoba. He should be able to escape, but here's the main issue. 
this tribute, the third one, is going to be the curse for the monkeys. And the boss is at the top lane, so they can literally just move to the top and get the boss immediately and then push with that, and they're already on the way. And you could definitely see that there was a bit of a disconnect here in the calls as well, because we see Genji going in deep, mm. and then the sanctification gets used behind him. So there was a bit of a problem there where we had an immediate kill against Genji after the salvo was already connected. If they just negate all that damage with the sanctification on the point, maybe they have a chance there. But it was such a fantastic setup with the arrow coming through, salvo connecting right afterwards, and the monkeys are just playing a fantastic second game here. And they have a massive push in the top lane. They'll have an arrow in about five seconds too, so they can force the fight. Zelt will spend their time defending middle and bottom lane, working on level 13, but they're gonna have to get up here and defend against this keep. And it's gonna slowly get whittled down from the monkeys. I mean, that's a dead keep. 13 talents, wall down, you're cursed. The question is, this, can you even go for core here? If they get a kill with this, that boss is not getting any damage because we are seeing, the, I mean, the curse is active. If they get a kill on top of this, they could go for core. Alex goes in for a jet propulsion, drops a whale, lights it as well. Arrow comes out, connects with Zarmony. They're trying to go for it. gear come out. They're going straight for this core. This boss is still healthy. But it's so, I mean, it's still not scaling properly, but they are three levels ahead at this point. We're so early in the game that they might be able to defend this. If this was a late game boss, the game would be over for sure. The boss is definitely going to take some hit points down. But there comes Sanctification. Well played. Alex on the retreat here. Still a talent advantage for the monkeys. Here comes the Salvo. Ancestral is through. They're trying to look for the kill. The core is already falling. The core is down to 70%. Zarmory might go down as well. Scatter Arrow comes in. They get that kill with the help That's of it. Phoenix. Maka goes straight for the core as well as they teleport in. And it looks like it. The monkeys believe they have the win in the back. And it's looking like it as they focus down the core. And they go up 2-0 to zero over the Zealots. 11 minutes and 40 seconds. A quick game. A really, really early boss here. So normally when you're looking at an 11 minute boss, you can't really do too much with it. But the big part was because of the curse, the keep never damaged the boss. So you have the boss just moving yeah. through. They're looking for a kill. And at that point, the Zealots already know we have to push past this somehow. We have to try and force them back here. But they are three levels behind and a talent behind. So it's not only that there is a stat advantage that is incredibly powerful, but you also have that big talent missing that you could use there. And I mean, that was just fantastic play by the monkeys. Great hats are play throughout the entire game. The Zelts are just having a hard time getting the train rolling, it seems like. They just can't find those fights that they want. So far, it's been a really good job of the monkeys making sure to cut away appropriately, having a concave setup, not allowing them to go for that dive. But they can't find that moment where they want to go in as a unit of four and secure the kill. I mean, we happen to see that in the bottom left curse where Quack went in for the aggressive dive as Genji trying to force a fight, but Tyrion dropped the sanctification right in the middle to posture around and make sure that Mount Furion didn't get caught by the Salvo. So that disconnect is really hurting them right here. And Alex and the crew were willing to take that lead, run with it a boss, and get the win. Yeah, it was a bit of a weird moment, and I'm not quite sure what Quack's thought process was there, but the second that the Salvo connects on all of them, he has to dodge that damage somehow. The mm. effect is not ready for him. He goes in deep. Actually, I think he popped it just a bit too early there because he was going for the engage. But if he just stays with the rest of the team and they eat on the sanctification, they can maybe play around it. I mean, it's already a bad spot. For yeah, him to it's be difficult. In. So it's it's really just like, okay, how can we salvage the situation? But when he falls and the immediate blow up against Genji happens, then you know it's a lost fight. So everybody else tries to scatter, tries to run, doesn't work out, they get picked off. And now it's a 2-0. And coming back from that, do they have really the mentality to pull it off in this series where they said, this is important. We need to beat these guys. But the monkeys, <laughs> I mean... The this monkeys. team is so insanely silly, it actually blows you, you my mind. You can't wrap your head around that. Yeah. You just can't. Last season, we, we, we come in 2018, and we hear Mark in the interview, and he says, like, we're going to be more competitive than ever. We really have found the motivation. We're saying, okay, we're going to the offline events. We're practicing, our, we're practicing more than we ever have, and we are going to contest our opponents. They have shaky starts, but they get their wins, mm. and then all of a sudden they have this, I think it was a reverse sweep as Team Liquid comes in, and their spirit is crushed. They fall apart. All of a sudden the games don't go as much, Flatline. and you're just like, and I mean, we bring in the Wheel of Wisdom because we're like, no one knows <laughs> if, they go, if they are having a great day or a bad Maybe day. Maybe we fixed them with the Wheel of Wisdom. That was our last match that we pulled that on. That yeah, was us. That was All us. All the wins on us. You're welcome. So they come in and say, we ourselves don't know what's going on. This season, they come in and say like, okay, you know what, boys? 
most of us are studying again, mm -hmm. so we're gonna do our best here. We're gonna really just we're gonna cut down our training time a little bit. We're going we're going for instead of two or three sessions per day, we're going into only like one, maybe half of it, just making sure that we get the practice in. We're gonna prepare, but there's a little bit where we split our attention now. All of a sudden, and now they look great. I'm just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's like. I don't know. The monkeys are playing pretty bananas right now, and we'll see if they can continue it as we get ready for game number three. We'll be right back after this commercial break to catch more of the action. Keep up with your favorite players and teams on the official HGC website for desktop and mobile. Stats, archived matches, and everything you need to stay up to date with the global Heroes of the Storm Esports League. Watch live on game days and upgrade your Heroes of the Storm knowledge. 2018 promises to be the best year yet. Look for expanded statistics, enhanced viewing experiences, and more on your home for the HGC. We have forgotten what makes us strong. Nice to see you around the heart once more. You know, even Paladin is definitely one of the strongest contenders, if not the strongest at this point. The actual class diversity still remains high. Bunny Hopper oh, has conceded. A8 is going to the Summer Championship. This time we're going to be seeing different takes on the same types of decks and different lineup strategies. Oh! Oh! oh. It's go time! This is the Hearthstone Summer Championship!
rough day for the Zealots, but a good day for the Monkeys. They are up 2-0 to zero over their opponents as they have been quite dominant, actually, in their engagements. As they continue to look for a 3-0 here as we get ready for game number 3. Did you expect this result so far today, Kaldor? Not quite. I actually thought that this would be a very close one, but I expected uh, the Zealots to be contesting the, the games a little bit more, and I actually thought that we would have a closer series where we're heading into, let's say, maybe even a fifth game. Yeah. Alex must have promised the team an extra couple of bananas or something, like because they are really stepping up. They want this. That potassium, man. Let's go to yeah. game number three here. Don't forget, there is a situation here where the monkeys could fall flat. I mean, remember, last phase, there was even a game where they forgot to switch heroes before we went into a match, and it completely kind of broke down for them. So there are I mean, things that could happen. For me, this... Uh, okay, so every time we approach a new phase, for me, it's really you look, okay, what is... We have eight teams in, uh, in the league, so... Who do you think are the top four? And usually between the top four there, you will see the teams that contest the offline spot who bring yep. up there. And when you look at the bottom four, it's normally the question, okay, who of those teams has a chance to establish still a playoff position and mm -hmm. then make it into an offline event if they have a really good run on that weekend? And who has to be careful about dropping into uh, the Crucible? And of course, early, uh, like early judgments are always a little bit iffy. You can definitely whiff it on a team that uh, all of a sudden plays extremely well. Best example would be the Zealots in Phase 1 of 2018. Yeah. But right now, when you look at what we have in terms of teams, the top four seem to be pretty established. You have Dignitas, Fnatic, Team Liquid, and Method. Sure. That's your immediate thought. Then you have a couple of dark horses around there. But what have we seen outside of that? We've seen Leftovers perform extremely well. They're looking good. That worked. Monkeys, much better than expected after what they said sure. before. And who else do we have? We have Granite Gaming, who understandably struggled a little bit. And now we have Zealots, Zealots who start to fall flat a bit. And we talked about it before, this is the first weekend, and they will need a bit more time to just find that synergy. They've been very, very open about this, especially after the loss that they suffered on Friday. But now you have to ask yourself, out of those four teams, who's likely to drop into the Crucible? Who will have to try and dodge those spots? And right now, there is a real scenario in which the Zealots could fall into one of these positions. Now, again, they can still improve over time. We still have nine more weeks. Yeah, shot calling is different, drafting is different, so it makes sense for them to need that time. But it's definitely a concern, and it has to be on their mind as well. So that's one of the things that we still have to think about when we're looking at this, and this could be a real threat. So. It's not easy for them to deal with that, too. And it's a battleground, too, here, where they need to make sure they have a strong early game against the Monkeys. And Monkeys so far in Game 1 and Game 2 have been getting the upper hand, because we are going to Sky Temple. Yeah, and when we're talking about a team potentially dropping into a Crucible spot, keep in mind, we're not only saying that they're losing every single match, but if you assume just for a moment that the Monkeys and Zealots could find themselves in a spot where they're very, very close in the standings towards the end, maps matter. And if you lose this series without taking a single one against your opponent, that's a problem. Yeah. So uh, for Zealots, it's incredibly important that if they don't turn around the series, they at least grab a few maps here. Well, they can grab the wheel now and turn around the series. And they have to actually and even stay in it. Reverse sweep. One of the best ways for them to get the victory, at least get a couple of maps. Zealots will open up with a Tracer Man right away. Monkeys answer back with an yeah. out of their man. It's also just a, the... Uh, how you enter from a motivational perspective if you go into uh, the first uh, part of the phase and you're saying well we just started with an o2 didn't did take one map if they lose here for example then they would be uh, one and six yeah that's not a great start and that's a problem so uh, this is the moment where the zealots really need to use that short minute break five minute break that we had and say like okay guys come on we can do this first of all we still can win this series but the most important part, we can at least take a couple of maps and set ourselves up for a decent map score. Well, they open up with Dahaka, very similar fashion to what we had in game at number two, looking to try and have that global and at least stay in the game. And that's something that Dahaka did do well, at least in Cursed Hall a little bit. It's kept them in the game in the situations where at least they have somebody something on the side. Just need to have a little bit more coordination when that rotation comes in from him brush stalking in. And that's something else, Guy Temple, I feel like it's a little bit easier to pull off. You can sustain through that night camp push that you typically see from a lot of teams nowadays on this map. Now, Monkeys, they get a strong opening. Genji comes yep. out from Ake, and of course, Blaze. That rotation is already so scary for me because last time we saw them with Blaze Hanzo, that was catering a lot to the map in particular. Mm. Now we're having uh, Genji taken for Marke and we have Blaze again, and that's already a great start for them. I feel for Zealots, I would really like to see an earlier Hanzo again because I think that especially on map number one, Chris performed incredibly well on him. And if they can follow anything, any, any 
initial stun up with a good arrow or just get one of Chris's arrows in again, that would be what can decide the team fights in their favor. And also you have more race potential towards the boss. So I would like Hanzo on their hand again for Chris in Chris's hands. I think that would be a great start for them. But the monkey is already with a fantastic rotation there. I want Greymane for Quack. I feel like also in game number one, there were a couple moments where the kills that did come in. Quack was able to get that go over the throat and find a couple of targets. I asked myself if they could, for example, play false set for Quack and run a double global on the map. There's Hanzo, loving that. The problem that I still have.